Jason Houston on two for Nick. We're less than one minute out. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I am ready. Milby High School, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Milby High School. How do you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. Students and faculty at Milby High School, welcome to the International Space Station. Good morning from everyone here in Milby High School on planet Earth. We have excited students here from Moby High School, D.D. Middle School, and Davila Elementary School ready to ask you questions about your life and research on the space station. Great, I'm Great. ready for the questions. We have our first student. Hello, my name is Leslie Garcia, and I am in second grade. My question is, how many experiments do you do in one day? What is your work schedule like? So we stay very busy up here. During my time up here, which is about a seven month mission, I'm going to participate and help support about 250 different scientific experiments. And so every day is crammed with different types of experiments, but every minute of every day is busy. We start at 6 a.m. is when I wake up, and we start work at 7.30 in the morning. We finish work at 7.30 at night, so that's a 12-hour work day. We do exercise and get to have lunch during the day, but it's a long work day, and we stay super busy. Thank you. Hello, my name is Paula Rodriguez, and I'm in the fifth grade. My question is how often do satellites break? Are you responsible for fixing them, and what happens to them if they are broken and can't be fixed? Yeah, so satellites can break. But normally, astronauts aren't responsible for fixing those. The, the two exceptions to that would be the International Space Station, my home right now. So if it breaks, then our crew up here tries to fix it. And, and that's one of our principal jobs is making sure the space station stays running. Uh, there's another example, which is the Hubble Space Telescope, and we did space shuttle missions to go fix that satellite. But satellites do break, and, and what we try to do is at the end of a satellite's life, before it breaks and it's stuck in space and just becomes space junk, if you will, 
Before that happens, we try to bring the satellite back in so that it burns up on reentry. So we slow it down so that it enters Earth's atmosphere and gets super hot and melts. Thank you. Hello, my name is Frank Tovar. I am from sixth grade. And my question is, how much oxygen does one astronaut need to spacewalk outside of the space station? So we take everything we need inside our spacesuit. So inside the backpack that you see on our spacesuits that we take during our spacewalks, there are two oxygen tanks. And between them, there's about five pounds of oxygen. But that really doesn't mean a whole lot. So really, we have enough oxygen to be able to comfortably do a seven-hour spacewalk and have spare in case we need it. Because the oxygen gives us pressure to gives us oxygen to breathe, but it also gives us pressure so that we can survive when we're working outside in the vacuum of space. Thank you. Uh, um, he, 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 like, here's my question. Are there any space movies that inspired you to become an astronaut? Most definitely. I'm a super big uh, sci-fi movie fan, and, and I can tell you that when I was around three years old, uh, my father took me to see the original Star Wars, and uh, ever since then, there's been a little spark in me that has looked up at the night sky, at all those stars, and wondered what's out there, and, and I think that that is the passion that I followed that led me to becoming an astronaut, the sense of adventure, the sense of wanting to go explore and discover new things. Hello, thank you for your response. I'm Izali and I'm in seventh grade. My question is, has any research done on this station led to anything that can help Earth's environment? Absolutely. You know, our mission up here is to do research. And, and some of that research is focused on understanding more about ourselves but a large part of that is trying to understand the world and the universe around us. So we observe the Earth's atmosphere, we observe the Earth's oceans, and we watch for changes, and we try to help provide data down to the scientists so that they can predict and see what's happening to the Earth. And if we have better knowledge about what's happening down on the Earth, then we have a chance of doing things to help improve the environment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ashley and I'm in seventh grade and my question is, what changes in space flight do you see in the incoming years? I don't know how many of you have heard, but we're planning to go back to the moon in five years. And so that's a big change. We're accelerating the things that we're doing today so that we can make it to the moon in five years, to, to land on the moon and then use that as a training ground, if you will, to prepare us for that longer journey to Mars. And so the things that we're doing right now on the space station, we're testing out some of those technologies that are going to be on the spacecraft that support us when we get to the moon, whether we're working on the surface or we're working in the gateway station that's going to orbit the moon. All of those are big changes that are happening, but the seeds of it are already begun, and it'll be exciting to be part of over the next five to ten years. Hello. Thank you for that response. My name is Yelsey, I'm a seventh grader from DD Middle School, and my question is, were you allowed to take anything in space to keep you from getting homesick? So that's the toughest part about space flight, is that in order to do this, I have to leave my family at home. And so, yes, I miss my wife, I miss our, our children, and I am able to bring some things. So I have pictures and little mementos that remind me of them. And it's important to maintain that contact and to, to understand that the emotional support and the psychological support of trying to spend a long time in space away from family is, is important and, and it needs to be addressed. We need to be thinking about those things when we decide we're going to go to the moon or go to Mars. We need to think that there's also a psychological component 
it. It's very important. Thank you for your response. I am Jason Santos. I am a sixth grader, and my question is, how often do you get to talk to your friends and family? I have to say that we're very fortunate with how much connectivity we have. So I'm an active duty Air Force officer, and I deployed, my first deployment was about 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago. And when I deployed to the Middle East, it was very difficult to be able to communicate with family. To make a phone call was difficult. It was, it was easier to send email or, or write a letter. Today, here on the space station, we have the ability to make phone calls down during the day. And I also get a video teleconference with my family so that we can see each other. So very similar to Skype or FaceTime, we're able to talk for 30 minutes over the weekends and, and get to catch up being able to see each other. So connectivity is absolutely amazing here on the space station. Thank you. My name is Miguel Hernandez, and I am a junior here at Milby. My question for you is, how difficult is the training to become an official astronaut? It takes a long time. And I, I think the one thing that, that uh, has made it a little easier for me is that I really love learning new things because our training is all about learning new things. I'm up here on the space station for seven months, and I have to be prepared to do just about anything just like the rest of my crewmates. So we learn a very diverse set of skills, whether it's how to fly an aircraft or how to provide medical help to somebody in need or how to repair very complex machines or to do a spacewalk or to operate a robotic arm. We do all of these things and more. And that takes time. So just at my time at NASA, I've spent five years getting ready for this mission. Thank you for your response. Um, hi, my name is Edgar. I'm in the 12th grade. And my question is, what do you do with your spare time in space? I try to have fun. There's lots of, there's lots of ways to have fun up here. Uh, the first thing that I do is I like to look out the window at the Earth because it's an amazing view to see the Earth glide by and to see mountain ranges and, and vast deserts and sand dunes and huge oceans that are the deepest blue. It's amazing to look out the window. The second thing I like to do is I like to float around. So it's a lot of fun to just fly around the space station, and we get to do it all the time. It, uh, it never gets old. But the third thing, and probably the, the, the most fun, is playing with food. So if you don't mind, I'm going to show you some tricks with Water. So I'm going to take some fruit punch that we would eat up here or drink up here and show you what you can do. We have a – everything has to be in a bag because if it was in a cup, it would just float out of the cup because everything up here is floating. And so I have some red fruit punch in here that I added some water to, so it kind of mixes together like Kool-Aid. And in this one bag, I have a little more than eight ounces, so it's like a soda can. And you can see the fluid just wants to come out like a bubble and float around. And I'm not even squeezing on the drink bag. And then we can play with it. And so we do this with our drinks and our food, and it's a lot of fun. So just like when I was in, uh, in uh, elementary and, and junior high and high school, playing with my food there. I keep doing it today. Thank you for your response. Hi, my name is Nyla. I'm in ninth grade. And my question is, why do you eat freeze-dried food? It's very difficult for us to have fresh food 
because it spoils pretty quickly, and we just can't go to the grocery store. So we have to find foods that we can pack months in advance and then launch to the space station, and then they'll be here for a long period of time. We try to keep a reserve on Space Station 2 in case we have trouble getting cargo vehicles up here, so we make sure that we have about six months worth of food. So six people, six months of food, all tucked away in a, in a closet, if you will. And so because of that, it has to be shelf stable. And some of that is, is dehydrated food where we take the water out and we just have to add water in. Some of it's irradiated and, and preserved in packets so that we can just open them up and eat them. Those are really similar to what the military uses for deployed soldiers. And, and so all of that is there at our disposal. If we had to have fresh food, we'd need resupply more often, or we'd have to start thinking about growing our own food. And that's one of the science experiments that we do up here. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Damien Hernandez. I am an 11th grader. I go to Milby, and my question to you is, how long can you stay in space? So we don't know the answer to how long is the longest we can stay in space. We know what we've done. And so the longest anybody stayed in space is over 430 days, and that was a, a Russian cosmonaut. Uh, the longest an American stayed in, in space is about 340 days, so about a year. And we're still pushing those boundaries. Myself, I'm going to be in space for 204 days. With the reason that we're continually pushing those boundaries is we're trying to discover what changes in the human body, because space is a harsh environment. I might be safe inside the, the space station here, but the fact that I don't have gravity pulling me down Gravity is not making me fall to the ground here. So all of my muscles don't have to work all day long. My bones don't have to support my weight. All of that on the ground keeps you strong. Your bones stay strong, your muscles stay strong, but up here, they waste away. So we have to exercise and we have to come up with countermeasures for it. And, and muscles and bone are just one facet of it. There's so many other things that change in the human body, and that's a huge part of what we're trying to discover here is what do we need to do to stay healthy on orbit? Because it's going to take us nine months to get to Mars. Thank you for your response. My name is Kenan Villanueva. I am a junior in Milby High School, and my question is, does being in microgravity cause any type of changes in the body? Let me tell you about a couple cool ones uh, that I've experienced. So I said that gravity is not pulling me down. So when I stand up up here now, I'm now two inches taller than I was on the ground because gravity is not compressing my spine, and so my spine has stretched out. I got to tell you, the first couple of weeks that that happened was pretty painful as all my muscles were being stretched along with, with my skeleton. And uh, once they relaxed, then everything felt, feels like normal. But I'm a couple inches taller up here. Because I'm a couple inches taller, I have more room in my upper torso. And so all of my, my insides actually shift higher and make my chest larger in space because gravity is not pulling all of my organs down in my abdomen. It does the same thing with blood inside of me and other fluids inside of me. Gravity on the ground would pull all that to the ground. Here, my blood pressure is evenly distributed. So to be honest with you, most days I feel like I've got a little bit of a, a stuffy sinus uh, head cold because there's extra fluid and pressure inside my head. Thank you for your response. My name is Michael Gonzalez, and I'm a ninth grader at Milby High School. And my question is, what is the most dangerous thing you've done in space? That's a tough question, because there's a lot of things that we do up here that are, that are dangerous. Uh, I think for me personally, um, when I launched to space uh, back in March, it wasn't my first time to launch in space. The, the first time I tried to launch in space was back in October, and, and my uh, cosmonaut commander, Alexei Chenin, and I 
were on a rocket two minutes into our, our flight when the rocket disintegrated underneath us. And we survived because a launch abort system pulled us away from the rocket as it was falling apart going 4,000 miles an hour. And it brought us down to the Earth safely. So I think for me personally, surviving that catastrophe was probably the most dangerous thing I've done to date. Thank you for your response. My name is Elijah Lozano, and I'm a junior here at Milby High School. And my question is, what are the effects of microgravity upon the growth and development of plant life, considering gravity has an important part in directing the direction of growth? That's a great question. Now, I taught, alluded earlier that it's going to be important for us, if we want to have fresh food, to figure out how to grow our own fresh food. So I'm actually standing right next to our veggie uh, growth facility here on the space station, and we just, uh, we just tore down the equipment, but we try to grow plants up here and figure out how to best grow those plants. On the ground, when it rains, the water lands on the, on the ground, and then gravity will pull that water down into the soil so that the, the roots of the plant can absorb that water and, and, and grow and thrive. Here, gravity doesn't pull that down, so we have to come up with special devices, pillows or, or pods that we put the plant seeds in that help distribute that water and help bring air to the root system and to the leaves and circulate that. So we have to create this artificial environment to support plant life. So it's something that we're still trying to figure out here uh, on the space station because it's super important. Uh, but it's, we're, as we're finding out, space is hard, and you're, we learn lots of lessons by, through failure, and we keep trying and trying. Thank you. My name is Christopher Gansino. I'm a junior, and my question is, who cuts your hair in space? Not the best haircut, but it, it's free. Uh, so up here, I said we get to be a, a little bit of everything, a doctor, a pilot, a robotic operator, a maintenance guy. We're also barbers, and so we cut each other's hair. Uh, some of us are more skilled than others, and uh, luckily no one's able to get too close and, and really critique uh, how we look. Thank you so much. On behalf of Houston Independent School District, Melby High School, Duty Middle School, and Davila Elementary, we would like to thank you so much for providing this wonderful opportunity for our students. Bye. Thank you. Chase your dreams. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all participants from Milby High School. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Thank you. 